Hello and welcome. As folks are tuning in, I just want to thank everybody for joining us on this lovely Thursday to dig in on all topics, AI, workplace intelligence, and really what opportunities exist for us to kind of merge these topics. How can we lean into emergent tools, technologies, systems to amplify what we do to design experiences, buildings, and really just work lives for people and occupants. But before we get started, I want to first introduce myself and our team at Plastark if you're new to our panels and webinars. My name is Amy Rosen, and I'm a sociospatial designer on a team called Plastark, and we believe that we can make the world a better place, one workplace at a time. This is our mission that we push forward with really relentlessly, and we do so through a number of means and through different services and sectors, but most predominantly we focus on employee experience strategy, change leadership, executive education, while continuously performing research on the back end. We're always interested in what's new on your minds, what you're thinking about and talking about, and collecting data, including on today's webinar. So if you're tuned in, get ready for a couple polls strewn throughout today's conversation. At Plastark, we believe that it's critical to take an interdis interdisciplinary approach to workplace. This is because if you're really trying to create an experience that suits all people and all branches of an organization, you have to think about the HR needs, the IT, the real estate, and how they intersect and intertwine, because that's really where the heart of workplace experience lies. And at the same time, in order to be not only inclusive, but confident in what we're proposing, what we're thinking about, and the decisions we're making, we like to collect as much data as possible. Something that we like to uh, like to show is this image of the jelly beans in the jar. And I like to say this wisdom of the crowds quote that the more people that guess how many jelly beans are in that jar, the, more, the closer you'll get to the actual number of jelly beans in the jar. Just a fun fact that kind of goes to show that more data is better than less data. The more points and people you're interacting with, the better you understand what's actually happening and the context that you're asking questions within. And with that in mind, I kind of want to first just gauge our audience and get a pulse on where you are in terms of the remote telework distributed work circumstance. So I'm gonna launch a poll now. And if you're tuned in, go ahead and let us know how many days per week you spent working remotely before COVID-19 restrictions. And then how many days per week you're working remotely now. Go ahead and answer those, those two questions while I cover a couple other things. So one additional thing that we really um, advocate for and push for at our team at Plastark is shifting the metrics that surround workplace. So you might be used to things that we refer to as building metrics or hard metrics, things like cost per seat, cost per person, square foot per person, all those things that you might typically associate with the built environment. But instead, we ask the question of how can we measure in terms of people, since they really are the most valuable asset in workplace. How can we think about things like accessibility, collaboration, connection, ergonomics, brand expression, all of those things that maybe feel intangible and immeasurable? How can we quantify those meaningfully? And so that's really what we've been applying as we've been navigating this moment of shift. I'm sure you're familiar with the pulse of workplace right now that we've really all been grappling with new new trends, new themes, new goals and priorities, whether it's reevaluating your workplace why, refreshing your space to fit new expectations, building a hybrid workplace model, building new and sustainable practices, reinforcing equitable experiences, or testing new things and collecting data. All of these are part of what we've referred to as our roadmap for the future. So before we get started in today's discussion, I just want to kind of leave you all with this, that we are here to help you achieve success. If you're thinking about these questions that we're talking about today, or if you just want to talk about how to make more efficient right-sized spaces, how to build a better user experience, create more engagement, or continuously learn, we are here to help. 
And we're also just here to talk with you. If you're thinking about any of the words on the screen here, I want to have a conversation and hear what's on your mind. What are you seeing in your arenas, in your sectors, and with your organizations about the future of work, change management, experience strategy, activity-based working, everything under the sun? But that's enough about me. Let's see what you all had to say about your remote work. What you're seeing on the screen here are results from a couple of years of webinars that we've conducted and some of the trends that we started to see, where on average people said they worked about 0.9 or one day remotely pre-COVID and about 2.7 going forward with a pretty dramatic shift there, right, to over half of the week. And it looks like folks on the line are pretty aligned in that regard with 95% of you being fully in office before the pandemic and now pretty mixed. I see a really nice um, mixture of five days, two days, zero days. So it's really nice to see the diversity on the line. And I think that'll play a role in your different questions and perspectives today. If you've joined our recent webinars, you know that with all of this data comes a new kind of circumstance for workplace design and decision making, right? If people are coming in anywhere from zero to five days a week, the amount of utilization and the people you're actually planning to design for is incredibly variable. What used to be pretty predictable is now a much larger aperture of variability. On any day, you could be at 10, 20% occupancy, all the way up to maybe 90 if you're having an all hands day. And so how to really accommodate that range is the flexibility question that we've been thinking about. And that's been the undercurrent of a lot of our conversations. But today we're going to focus a little bit more on because you're only coming in a portion of the week, or some of you maybe are coming in for the full week, what does that mean for your why, why you're there? The fact that maybe the actual value and purpose of space needs to lean more heavily into what we refer to as occupant experience, that we really need to avoid the pitfall that is real estate as object and think about the actual interactions and the experience and the confluences that happen when you're in space with other people. And this aligns with a lot of the trends that you've probably been taking stock of. Things on your mind might be change in flexibility, collaboration, social connection, sustainability, well-being, technology, hybridity, or even augmentation and automation. And as you likely assumed, we're leaning into that last one today. And I'm going to use that as our kind of kickoff point to introduce the panelists that have joined me to really dig deep into these conversation topics. First, we have Dan Stein, who I would love to welcome. Dan is tuning in from San Antonio, Texas, where he is the Director of Design Technology and leads the internal research program investigations at the top-ranked architecture firm, Lake Flato. He's a registered architect, educator, author, blogger, international speaker, and in addition to teaching graduate students at, at NDSU, He's written 18 textbooks, which are used extensively in the academic market. So I can say confidently that Dan knows what he's talking about. And I'm excited to hear not only his perspectives on digital technology within the architecture, engineering, and construction industries, but also how he's applying that to his dedication to further the design profession. So welcome, Dan. Thank Next. you. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Next, we have Elena Beloshapkova. Elena was named Businesswoman of the Year by Ernst & Young and is the CEO and founder of AI-driven workplace platform, Inscape. Elena founded Inscape with a remarkable track record of 18 years working with Fortune 500 companies all around the world. And in her 10 years as CEO and founder, she saw many clients dissatisfied with existing workplace management platforms. That helped her to kind of see the problem firsthand and ignited her mission to help companies operating in hybrid, remote, or in-office settings. So with eight patents in technology and design under her belt, her vision is to become an indispensable solution for every company managing their workplaces, both physical 
and digital while increasing productivity and enhancing employee and visitor experience. And Elena, I'm sure you're gonna apply all of that to today's conversation. Thank you so much. I couldn't have said it better. Uh, thanks so much for this wonderful introduction. And I'm very excited to be here and talk about everything AI related in the workplace. Amazing. Thank you again. And last but not least, we have Federico Negro, who's joining from Brooklyn, New York, where Federico is the founder and CEO of the Kanoa Supply Company. Kanoa is a collaborative software for FF&E design and lifecycle management with a mission to make it easier for more people to design more sustainable interiors. Previously, he was the head of physical design at WeWork, and he was also the co-founder and head of project groups at Case Incorporated, which was acquired by WeWork back in 2015. Federico will be bringing his passion for design architecture, prefab, technology, housing, climate, decarbonization, and others to today's conversation, thinking about how AI, technology, and specifically the intersection of software development and the built environment really relate to construction, product and process design, scaling design-driven companies, and entrepreneurship. So I'm thrilled to have you here with us today, Federico, and welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> and I'm actually going to kick it off to you first to start us off. I know a, on a lot of people's minds, the topic of AI, artificial intelligence is a little bit taboo. Perhaps people on the line have a mixed spectrum of knowledge and awareness of what really is AI. Where did it come from? Why is it on everybody's minds? So I think first and foremost, we should take a step back, maybe reflect a little bit on where we've been and how we really got here. So from your perspective, how did we get here? What's kind of changed? And how do you think this led to the moment we're in right now? Um, the thing, you know, thanks for, thanks for the question. I think it's important to, <clears throat> to always start with, with context, of course, um, you know, and, and as it pertains to, technology and specifically in design or in AC. Um, of course, we, we have a long trajectory of software making its way into, into our field, you know, many decades um, of it. Um, and, you know, I think what, what you'll hear in general is, you know, AI is not new, but really something has changed in the last uh, year or two. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll focus, I'll focus more on, on, on that, Part of it, um, the you know the way the way we see it, um, the way we see it is 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 really that there's been um, uh, a bit of a revolution in uh, access more so than just a revolution in in the technology itself, uh, and 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 you know what we mean by that is that the way in which uh, you know you have a technology that had been largely sort of incredibly expensive to be able to access, incredibly sort of uh, difficult to be able to um, uh, to handle in a way. And what's happened over the last few years is that it's become productized to the point where now anybody sort of writing a Google Doc, um, you know, is able to access it. And so its applications explode, of course, tremendously. Uh, it's it's um, 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 and 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 and. You know, and and we we equate that with saying like it used to be a time where you know more dif more difficult tools um, had more buttons on them. There, you know, there's this sort of you, you have this image here, say of AutoCAD or even say Revit. Uh, at some point, you know, the more the more features or buttons you had, maybe the more you could you could actually charge for the software or something like that. Um, now, um, really, we're we're in an age of simplicity where where it's not about a few super super users to come in and are the only ones or the sort of like the keepers of the keys of this sort of magical new features or software. It's now it's like well anybody who understands natural language can actually access it. And so, you know, where it used to be tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to train and onboard and implement things, now it could take an hour. Uh, it could take thirty minutes. Um, and so. That's that to us is the big real shift that's happened is 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 access and and on top of all that is the business model that comes with it. Many of these are free, right? And so and so it's not just that it takes a lot of money to like onboard people or used to uh, take a lot of money onboard people. The software itself also costs a lot of money. And now we have these sort of 
you know, very sort of consumer consumer level technology becoming so, uh, you know, so able um, that, you know, for free or, you know, or for just a few dollars, you're able to access it and many, many people can can access it. And so that's, I think that's really what's what's changed. And that's why we see AI everywhere now. Um, uh, it's, it's applications continuing to explode. If I if I go a little bit deeper and want to go sort of too deep on this, there's there's really two main things that, um, <clears throat> you know, I think that uh, um, two types of data in our industry that are that have really been hit um, by quote unquote like the the wave of AI, and one of them is is with, within natural language, which is just written word, which you know, we we see all the time in specifications and meeting notes and minutes and all of these things that are required of us, of course, um, and then and then um, uh, and then in what we would call sort of uh, computer uh, vision or image, you know, image uh, um, uh, image models, where you know pixels are able to um, to be translated into um, you know into into um, um, basically a a um, uh, meaning or or some sort of early semantics. And so what you what you have with that. Is that with the combination of these two things, two of the three vectors are the third, right? But two of the three main deliverables or data or data uh, or types of data that our industry works with are now being covered. By the time the third one comes about, right? Like now, you know, it it it, it creates a you know it creates a sort of pervasiveness into into the system that that is that becomes really interesting. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. I think that's that's um, you know that's that's sort of how we see um um what's what's changing and and we know and I, we think it's all only going to accelerate from here given all of the investment that's going into it yeah i think the way that you illustrated that or kind of almost painted that picture was really helpful and showed all the the kind of maybe vectors that are really feeding into this moment of of excitement but also perhaps fear i i think some of this may feel sudden to folks even though we just acknowledge that it's been a slow build, but it's something that I think we may not even realize is already pervasive in our day-to-day -day lives. I'm I'm curious, maybe if we pass it over to, to Dan, if you want to jump in and maybe build on some of the points Federico just made, but also talk about how we've already been using it without even maybe knowing about it. Uh, one, one thing that came to mind as Federico was talking is, there's a book called The Lean Startup by Eric Rise, and he illustrates, you know, very elegantly how um, the shift in implementing something like coming up with an MVP for a product, for example, um, involves what people actually need or want. And you think about um, in that in the book, he talks about the hard drive market and how when the the portable hard drive came out, there was a lot of features that we gave up. So to his point, Federico's point about giving up a bunch of buttons. We, we also <laughs> sometimes give up control, but we have all these new opportunities for inspiration and efficiency and exploration. And so that that's really cool. But then also, like you said, Amy, there's uh, interesting tools. A lot of architects like my peers are already using that are AI powered and they might not even realize it. Uh, for example, Enscape, the real-time rendering visualization software that a lot of architects use that is based on um, different design platforms like Revit, SketchUp, Rhino, ArchiCAD. Um, if you have an RTX, uh, NVIDIA RTX graphics card in your computer, Enscape actually, um, they actually commissioned me to write a, an article about the, their implementation of this about a year and a half ago on their website. Um, they use uh, something called the Tensor cores on that GPU. So in case you don't know, NVIDIA is um, one of the leading uh, AI chip manufacturers in the world. And, and so Enscape uses this deep learning super sampling NVIDIA functionality on the graphics cards uh, and uses AI to upscale the resolution. So it can do less compute uh, and therefore work on bigger models. And, and be really responsive and, and efficient. So that's really cool where some of us are using AI already and don't even know it. And then Autodesk, for example, um, a lot of architects use Revit and an opportunity to do early energy modeling within that ecosystem is Autodesk Insight. 
And that's a cloud-based tool that actually calculates multiple uh, values for each input uh, to allow you to explore different configurations of wall assemblies and window types and internal loads. And it uses a what's essentially a subset of, of AI and machine learning. And it's done that for several years now to help um, uh, more quickly get to really accurate answers within that range of, of values. So there's there's a lot of really cool opportunities there that that some of us are using and, and don't even actually know it. I love that. I think it's it's such an exciting moment to almost question our own tools and devices, right? I think what you were as you were talking, I was asking myself, how many tools do I use that I don't even realize have a layer of automation or a layer of machine learning, right? That we've just become so accustomed to almost. It's it's become integral in our operations to a point where the threat of AI really isn't a threat. It's more of a how much more do we want it in our lives and why why should we invest in more intentional implementation perhaps? And I think that this is a perfect time to pass it over to you, Elena, to, to jump in and maybe share your thoughts on that why. What what have you seen and learned in your in your work with various companies and organizations about some of the value add here and, and why AI can be beneficial. So first of all, there are so many different use cases of AI in a uh, workplace. Um, I can start with the most basic ones, like, you know, how much space do we need? Uh, uh, and uh, our platform allows you to come, you know, measure everything for a couple of weeks and give you predictions on how your space will be used by not just by anyone, by by your specific company, by your specific team members um, in 2025, in 2026, in 2027. And uh, some of the customers, uh, for example, their goal is to save, uh, let's say, 67% by 2027. So how exactly can you do that based on the data that you have right now, based on the data points that you have already? Uh, what will your team members need? Uh, from space, how can you, uh, how can you figure out which floor plan will suit their needs better? So, space optimization and predictive analytics is probably one of the most common use cases, um, and uh, I do believe that everyone should try uh, to test it because it's uh, fascinating uh, on how how easy it is and how, like this tool just didn't exist ten years ago, and uh, it fascinates me every single day. I'm like, what can you get out of uh, the platform. Um, the second biggest category is how can we make this existing space more effective? Uh, how can we make sure that we will enhance productivity of our team members uh, by offering them the most effective version of the physical workspace that we can provide them with? Um, and another, I would say, part of this question is Right now, workspace, it's not just your physical workspace. You know, it, it's not just your physical office. It's way more than that. Because again, as you saw in the results of this poll, you know, half of us, we don't even uh, come to the office uh, that often. So our workspace right now is, our digital workspace is a huge part of our <laughs> workspace experience. So uh, AI should cover it all from, uh, that's my belief. So, uh, and the third main category is employee engagement. Everyone uh, is trying to measure employee engagement. Uh, it is quite difficult to measure it because you have to uh, ask people and you have to rely on uh, on you know them uh, being able to uh, find time in their busy schedule to answer uh, some questions. So instead of you just relying on their answers, you can also ask the system what your team members need. And based on the data points that you already collected about how they use the space, what they like, what they don't like, what time do they come to the office, uh, which spaces they like the most and prefer to use, uh, which spaces they prefer to use for collaboration, and which spaces they prefer to use when they want to be left alone uh, uh, with a cup of coffee in a phone booth, something like that. So you already have this data uh, and AI just adds the next level uh, to your existing uh, experience. And you can easily ask in space AI, like, you know, what do I need to do to increase uh, employee engagement? What do they need out of the system? How can I improve my uh, existing uh, space? 
And um, I don't know, again, it's uh, sky's the limit. You can ask so many questions and there are so many interesting use cases. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, how can we save 80% on rent? And this is a real case study with uh, one of our clients here in Boston. And another one is like, how can we increase um, employee engagement or productivity by 30%? So there are so many different ways how you can uh, enhance experience through uh, AI tools. I love that. And I especially appreciate the way that you almost flagged how first identifying your metrics and almost goals is perhaps even more critical now because there's so many ways to to change and invest and evolve using AI. And even specifically in the ways that you were just illustrating, you can go in such a wide direction accidentally if you don't have a very clear goal, right? And I think some of the data I was talking about earlier and the trends I was alluding to speak to some of the points you were making about the relevance of space optimization right now, that perhaps we don't need as much real estate, perhaps we don't need as many desks, perhaps it's more a question of how to manage that space more effectively to your point or make it more functionally and sensorially diverse and engaging. But I, I think there's, there's even some other perhaps trends and factors playing a role in the value of AI here. And perhaps these are even beyond the context of the occupant experience. And Federico, I think you have a unique perspective on this given where you sit in the in your sector and in your role and kind of your how you've been observing what trends are playing a, a role here. So would you mind jumping in and maybe share your take on, on the why? Um, yeah, the, so, so, what we have seen, um, I can I can probably split it, and I I won't do a a very I won't be a very eloquent about it, but bear with me. <laughs> um, we can probably split uh, what's really happened um, into a, into a series of of phases, if you will. Um, there was the what I would call like so the the during the pandemic kind of experience shift that happened the six foot radius that we've now all forgotten about and all of these kinds of things that 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 happened in that moment um, that very clearly um, uh, put you know the way that our environment is designed um, into 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 focus. Uh, at some point, that gave way to what we call the what we would what I would call the next phase, which is just like the immediate post. Uh, sort of like just coming out um, phase, which which now was like, well, you know, the six foot thing is gone. We have, you know, we have vaccines now. We we were in, you know, we're in this sort of post. What do we do now? We've just spent two to three years uh, retraining our whole workforce to not work from the office. Um, and so, you know, why are we here? <laughs> why do we have this? Um, and, um, and that period to a degree is still happening and what we're about to enter and might not even really enter until I would say 2026, potentially like a full five years post pandemic, um, is, is what we'd say, okay, what, what's the, what's the true 21st century version, or at least early 21st century version of what the workplace should be. Cause we were still very much living in the 20th century version of it, right? Like the, the second half of the 20th century, and really 1980s moving forward, went all the way through 2019. Um, and, you know, a few things here and there, like, you know, open office getting maybe like too wide and things like that, but like the trends were were very much the, were very much the same. And so frankly, I have no idea what's gonna, you know, what will happen next. What we do know and what we do see in terms of trends are first and foremost are that um, the ratios, it's not that they will be changing. They've already changed. They changed years ago. Um, so, so the idea that um, you know one desk equals one employee is gone. That's 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 completely done. The second thing is um, you know the motivation, the function of why people even have a space uh, has fundamentally changed as well. And so, and so what happens now, and what we like to say is probably the biggest shift that's happened is that it used to be that you used to have a physical space, and then you'd have this technology layer to augment the physical experience and you know things like slack or zoom or whatever it is it they all they all were uh, attachments to or sidecars to the physical experience that relationship has flipped and so now 
the physical experience is an attachment to an augmentation of an extension of the digital experience. And that's the fundamental difference that's changed. And so now, you know, so 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 as an attachment to, as a nice to have, if you will, the physical experience now has a little bit of, a, of an additional freedom to be something else. Um, and so what we're seeing is is a, effectively we're saying what we're calling a um, a shift to the a shift to the edges where the the you know with less space with less need with all that we have the opportunity some companies are taking the opportunity to make nicer spaces but fewer of them or smaller of them or uh to you know or to really lean into this idea of this sort of temporary sort of transient space which is which is mostly like hey let's do Super fun, super collaborative space, really quickly, six months in and out, you know, and we're done. And it's the middle, the middle of that, of that demand curve um, that, you know, at least we see. I mean, we we have a where we we see it from the perspective of a software company, but whenever we we sort of training people or talking to them, designers use our tool about what they're designing. So it, 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 it's clear the trends are always. Um, either it's something that's you know meant to be here for thirty years or something that's going to be here for six months, and the middle is the middle is seems to be missing at this moment. That's really interesting, and I think it's it's almost similar to even just the way that we make decisions, right? It's so easy to to think short term, it's easy to think long term, but it's always that middle term kind of gray area that feels blurrier, and it's always something that's that's tricky, and so it's. It's interesting to hear you align that almost with the trends surrounding AI, but I, I also just appreciate the way that you were comparing the role of technology and real estate to one another and the flip that's happened and the the almost emphasis that maybe we need to be giving to AI automation technology more than space in our questions, in our um, contemplation of how to create a viable workplace, right? Whether that's from a user experience perspective or a building performance perspective. Um, maybe we can dig a bit deeper into what you were talking about, Elena, when you were talking about the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and how um, your platform really thinks about facilitating better user experience. I'm specifically curious about that almost application you were speaking about where you can almost customize space for different people or teams or make it feel like it's suited just for you by using AI. So how does that really work? And um, maybe you can shed some light on, on InSpace's role in that. Yeah. I would love to. So uh, we work a lot with uh, architects uh, and uh, typically architects like to work in teams and one day you can be assigned to one project uh, and you have to work with this specific team uh, and preferably you can, you know, uh, a lot of us we like to work, you know, together on uh, this project in the same space. And then tomorrow you will work on a completely different project with a completely different team. And uh, third day, you might be uh, on the customer side uh, and fourth day you might be traveling. So um, what I really like about uh, the way that you can manage it better now is that you can uh, tell AI to create assignments based on the projects uh, and make sure that, you know, now it's not like an office manager's job to manage everything. Now you can just connect to whatever system you use to manage your projects. And uh, in space, we'll assign, you know, seats to people according to their needs and also their personal preference, uh, according to their projects. Um, and again, we are all very different. You know, um, we can take into consideration uh, what this specific person likes to, uh, what this specific person needs for um, for themselves to be the most like productive version. Uh, some of us, you know, it can be uh, remembering their favorite coffee. Uh, it can be reminding them to uh, book a parking spot. It can be uh, pinging them when their boss will be uh, in town, uh, or it can be booking the right space uh, to work on this specific project with uh these specific team members so again um there are so many ways how you can uh do this and real-time uh data integration is a key um because again uh this whole concept of smart uh assignments and uh, uh plus edit um criteria of uh, employee uh preference 
uh, can really be a game changer to uh, a lot of companies. And again, sometimes I'm talking about like really small and it sometimes like seems insignificant, like who cares about uh, the coffee order? But just imagine working in a company where uh, the system remembers everything about you and knows what is your favorite desk? Where do you like to sit? Who is your favorite colleague? Um, so from the employee perspective, from the user exp um, experience, it looks like you have a very smart personal assistant, especially if you never have a personal assistant, uh, it's gonna look really cool. But from the company perspective, from the admin perspective, you collect all these data points and you can truly understand uh, people, not just by asking them the right questions, but also by seeing how they actually use your uh, office, how they actually use your space. So. I love that. It seems so intuitive to just invest in something like that and make it, I love the analogy of it. It's your personal assistant. Just because it's technological doesn't mean that it can't be helping you. It can't serve you as your, your little chat function or um, really just employee experience amplifier, I would say. I'm curious if folks on the line have either used AI in a similar fashion to what Elena is speaking to, or just in any other fashion to enhance the employee experience at, at your organization. So go ahead and jump in that poll and let us know. And while you're doing so, I wanna pass it back to Dan. Um, we've been talking a lot about how to elevate employee experience or the role of AI in that capacity. I wanna maybe take it a step back before employees are ever on site, before any user engages with the space, the design team has to really play a big role in framing that entire world. So how do you see AI kind of coming into that territory? How do you see it or how are you currently leveraging AI in, in the, with the goal of optimizing design? Well, we use um, we do use a lot of tools, and I'm, I'm going to touch on this a little bit more later. But of course, we also occupy and utilize space, and have recently just remodeled our space. So there's some fun things to share there. But interesting, there's there's so many tools, and it seems like every day there's a new AI enabled tool available for us to use. Or uh, some of them are generic and not industry specific. Like Zoom has. AI enabled note taking capabilities and their their newer advanced whiteboard feature has a really cool thing where you can pull in, <clears throat> for example, a bulleted list and use AI to make a mind map of this or um, expand this this outline or or reduce it in size. I'm going to share my screen really quick and just show a couple of graphical examples of industry specific tools that we've been taking advantage of that are, are pretty cool. Um, so here's a, a pretty bland view of a residential model. This is actually a model from one of my textbooks uh, on how to use Autodesk Revit designed for uh, the academic market. And uh, just with something simple like this early on in, in the design of a, of a building, you could run it through an, an AI tool and, and everybody on the calls probably heard of the text to image tools like Midjourney and Dolly. Um, well, some of those opportunities have been again, packaged up and designed uh, for our industry. So with just uh, some text prompts, but also some opportunities to, to pre-control the geometry we can get some really interesting results like this. Um, you can see over here that atmospheric is checked. So it made it kind of overly dramatic, but it's still a really cool sort of inspirational thing. And then um, there's another tool that we've used called Open Space. And you can see this picture of me here with a, a 360 degree camera attached to my hard hat and I could walk the project site. This is our own office remodel. Uh, a little over a year ago, I was um, I could do it daily, but usually it was once a week. We'd walk the project, and AI actually determined where you were in the building based on where you said you were going to start on a floor plan, and then um, it essentially creates like a Google Street View, but with a, a ability to um, step through time. And, and then they have some newer functionality that can actually see exposed studs and, and see uh, conduit and pipe start to show up and 
predict the amount of completeness of different parts of the project using AI, but just the ability uh, for a client, for example, I think you have access to this data for 10 years after a project is done um, that you could go back and see concealed conditions, but also during construction, um, sometimes the contractor would be the one walking the project. And if it's, you know, Lake Plato does work all over the country and, and islands and the um, Pacific and the Atlantic. So uh, it's it can save a lot of environmental footprint and embodied carbon of not having to travel to a site, for example. Um, here's another example of a, a SketchUp is a pretty popular modeling tool. And um, they've created an add-in using stable diffusion. So super simple model on the left, and then you get these really interesting inspiration images on the right. Uh, maybe not something we would show to the client. Maybe maybe it is. It, it all depends on the project and the client. And uh, But then this might inspire us to go back and make changes to the model and the material and um, kind of create this iterative process. And then the last example here real quick is, is like a 40 second video on this building code software we use called Upcodes we can basically start to have a conversation with the building code and um, you first specify your location. So is the project in Minnesota or is it in Texas? And you can ask it, is a vertical grab bar required in an accessible toilet room? And in Minnesota, it'll give you two paragraphs and all these references of why it's required. And then in Texas, it'll say one simple sentence, no, it's not required because it's because it's not. So there's some really great um, opportunities that are starting to come to fruition from all these great developers out there, like Elena and Frederico. That was so, fantastic. Yeah, go for it. Dan, did I cut you off? I'm sorry. No, no, that's that's good. Um, that's the, Those are the highlights. There's so much more to say, but... Yeah, that was a fantastic kind of array of options and and tools that you're using. I especially loved the personification of the building code. Like back in architecture school, I wished I could ask my book a question instead of Google or, and I even had Google, right? Back in the day, didn't even have that. So this is just so exciting to see the ways that it's becoming more, more human and, and personal, but also the way that that design process that you were walking us through is being optimized because we can account for all these variables and factors and ways that our, our brains simply can't process. And I know speaking of kind of software and specific tools, Federico, you developed one yourself and your team and you were really working in a specific and relatively niched area of workplace at the FF&E market. But I think it applies a lot of the principles that Dan was just illustrating in some of those examples and takes it even a step further with some other layers of machine learning and otherwise. So I, I would love to hear a little bit more from you about kind of what led to the need that you saw for that platform and then how does it how does it work? How does it help? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen as well. Um, just have it as a background. Um, but what we what you see here is what we call the canvas, which is is Canoa. This is the software that that we've developed. Um, I'll give a little bit of context on the history. Uh, you said it in the introduction. I I ran uh, design um, for WeWork prior to Canoa for several years, um, and I had come there through their acquisition of a, another company called Case, where we we worked. Um, uh, helping lots of companies in this industry implement technology better, extend technology, develop technology. Um, and so we, there's this, you know, we, we've, we've, you know, I've spent, let's say my 20 years of, of career at this point um, in what I like to call the, the tooling of design or how design gets done, uh, which is different from, you know, say like just the end product in and of itself. And so um, the 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 way in which I approached that that job at WeWork was very much around sort of tooling this company to be able to scale. It went from, you know, 10, 20 locations to 500, you know, very quickly. And so all of the processes, the technology that you need and all of that. The, the main insight from that experience was um, 
that in all of the things and and sort of that the the whole value chain of 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 retrofit, which is what we work did, and the sort of, sort of typical TI model. Um, that was really underserved um, by technology was the realm of epiphany. And so what you see here is um, a sort of typical workflow for a designer uh, that is designing in epiphany space. This is a, you know, like a, a an infinite, we call an infinite canvas that you're able to uh, come around and uh, navigate, et cetera, et cetera. And you're able to, you know, but it's semantic in the sense that it has actual real specifications that you can, that you can um, uh, work with, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll show a couple of examples of how, um, whether you know it or not, how Canoa is using and implementing AI to help uh, designers. Our core, our core function is to make this particular space better for this type of designer. Um, and in that, um, we we subscribe to what we call a co-pilot model or or um, where you know we're our our only goal is to allow or help the the designer get more cycles in the same amount of time and to potentially explore um, let's say discover um, uh, surprising spaces or things that maybe they weren't able to do and so um, you know, here I have, you know, just copy pasted an image from uh, from the internet. Uh, what you see is that there's this, there's this layer, we talked about access before, I didn't have to do anything, I didn't have to do whatever, I just copy pasted an image, and already Kanoa is trying to recognize if there are any furniture elements in this image, you know, .png, um, and so it does, it recognizes that there's some objects here, it understands that it's round, it understands its color, it doesn't know what it is yet. Uh, but you know it's doing now it's running a matching algorithm or, around you know our own database and seeing well there's a bunch of other things that have a similar form factor there's there's round thing this round thing this round thing this round thing and one of them may or may not be a match of course in this case you know uh you know we find this element and we just happen to have that in our you know in our in our database for products and you're able to see it um the same thing say it could happen um, um, in uh, with an object may, where maybe it doesn't recognize it. Uh, and so, but it but it's trying to, it's trying, it still gave us chairs and it still gave us soft seating, right? And so in a way, and it's doing this just through images. We didn't sort of, you know, hard code all of this stuff. And so what, what really what we're seeing is a transition from what we'd say, you know, parametric or, 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 um, um, or um, uh, let's say, option option based models that are really configurators that within a design space you can get you know any number of infinite possibilities uh what machine learning uh com, you know what what this is doing is using computer vision which is one type of 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 ai um to recognize that there's an item here and then using uh and then running a recommendations engine which is using uh machine learning to understand over to to learn and get better and better and better that there is a that there is a uh, that there's a match here um, that that can be made, um, and so as this gets better, of course, designers can do more. The other thing we can do um, is now similar to say like Spotify, as you're driving into a you know you say you you like a song and it begins to create a taste profile for you. Uh, that we're able to that we're able to begin to understand if if this object is one thing, then there might be some other elements that are used along you know that that would be used alongside this element. So say if I bring this chair here and I find friends again, and maybe there's this other I you know there's this table, then I find friends again, um, and you know here's this other uh, element. And as I go through this, what we're helping the designer do is just again go through more cycles and go through more cycles with structured data, but in just as just as playful of a way as we used to. I would have had to go to every one of these websites to find all this information to get these images to get all of that. And of course, you know, if I just want the actual, you know, the actual images themselves, the, uh, the marketing images, uh, I'm able to get that as well. And so there's lots of things here that that you can do, um, and and all of these. Um, really are just augmenting the designer in 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 their process as they go. Um, you know, somebody mentioned before the you know the idea of say like circularity, for example, is a big trend we see in workplace now. You know, you have all this stuff. Why do you want to uh, go out and buy a bunch of new things? And we see, uh, I'll go down to the floor plan down here, but we see a lot of um, offices turn into now this kind of layout where workstations have been sort of cleared out. And now we see a lot of sort of team homes and congregation spaces and those kinds of things. 
and you want to be able to say reuse the components that you know reuse a lot of the goods that you had and so the ability to we see that as fundamentally a data problem and so the ability to go in here um you know understand what this thing is understand whether we own it or we don't own it so there's an inventory management system and then of course be able to to make changes add change whatever it is and action upon this information really quickly so all of these all of these things are um we see them as surgical um implementations of different types of technologies to always aid a, a specific workflow it's not the technology itself is almost unimportant it's what's the workflow that it's trying to that it's trying to that it's trying to augment what's the workflow that it's trying to uh to improve so that you know we can do more we can do better uh you know for our clients for 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 this planet you know i'll, I'll sort of end with saying um you know the vast majority of the work that that like sort of goes unseen if you will in our cities is is all of this constant retrofit that happens over and over and over and over and over and over again um and all of that stuff is being done by people today and 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 you know and if we can do it better we we you know design design is 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 largely uh, a positive force in our world and so the more that we can get design out into the world the more that we're able to um, uh, improve access to design from our perspective um you know the better and so um these types of spaces that are lighter that are lighter weight that are more flexible um all of these types of spaces are you know what we're seeing a lot of you know a lot of companies move toward because they feel softer they feel lighter they feel you know there's there's less embodied carbon in them of course and they also feel more forgiving if we if we um if we made a wrong decision <laughs> we can change our minds um you know, like maybe our maybe our physical spaces don't have to be as hard coded as they used to be. Absolutely. And it's just phenomenal how easy this makes the process, how easy it is to make better decisions, smarter, more sustainable, healthier, and more aesthetically pleasing decisions, right? All in one place. Mm -hmm. Just that that whole system. But I, I think it's important to note that even though the data is at your fingertips, that data is perhaps publicly accessible or a little less confidential so to speak and I, I bring that up because we got a question in the chat from one of our our folks in the line about the kind of degree of pushback that perhaps we get from privacy advocates legal hr and on collecting and using individual data and i think that brings us back to the conversation around employee experience and i'm sharing the results from the poll because it looks like most folks in the line don't use ai to influence their employee experience and perhaps this is why. So I think, um, Elena, you're probably best suited to jump in here and share some of your thoughts on, on that question. And I'm also going to continue this show and tell trend and share your, your platform. Sounds good. So before we go there, I just wanted to uh, share a little bit of uh, my own personal uh, experience as someone who worked with some of the most talented architects for the past uh, 10 years. You know, I had a chance to work with Zaha Hadid, with uh, Herzog de Miron. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, and me and my team, we've done maybe 750 uh, projects worldwide, you know, headquarters, uh, uh, all kinds of large offices up to 5 million square feet. Sometimes you're in different time zones and sometimes a tool like Federica just, you know, showed us uh, could really help us understand uh, architect's vision and help build the bridge between architect's vision and a furniture dealer or a furniture manufacturer or a furniture producer. Because sometimes, um, uh, you know, yes, you can kind of like uh, use your best judgment as a furniture person to help uh, um, kind of like offer um, whatever piece of furniture that will work for this space. But if you have this product that Federico just showed us, it's just going to save a lot of time to people who are mm -hmm. working uh, with your uh, design and, uh, and then you'll get a better result. So again, what I love about AI is that now uh, you can really build better offices uh, using AI tools. Uh, again, sometimes that helps you design a better office uh, based on the your knowledge, based on your experience, based on the data that you have about your uh, specific customer and what they need out of space. So 
Can you just pause here for a second? I wanna also, before we jump here, I wanna uh, answer the question that we got from Niels. So the question is, uh, I love all the opportunities that uh, come with the broader use of AI tools in making the office more efficient and productive. To what degree do you get pushback from privacy advocates, legal HR uh, on collecting and using individual data? So first of all, uh, we are not a, we are not trying to build a big brother here. And I'm very, um, you know, I do take a lot of measures uh, 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 on uh, how not not to uh, create anything that will cause more harm than good. And I do take it very seriously, you know, ethical, um, um, it, there are so many ethical uh, barriers that we, uh, that we um, create uh, on purpose uh, in order for us to make sure that we will not share information, even information about employees to their employer that can be used um, to create more problems than good. So I do take it very seriously. And again, I can like that probably deserves like another two hour conversation. So um, the most important is that you as an employee can choose what to share or what not to share. Um, it's totally up to you. You, it starts with like basic uh, stuff like, you know, you can choose not to be even like shown on the floor plan. Uh, or like not to share, you know, what kind of coffee you prefer. Um, anyway, it's a very simple example, but uh, it is you are in control. Uh, you can totally decide what you want to share or what you don't want to share. Uh, and then uh, obviously this is company's data. This is not our data. This is not somebody else's data. It is your private environment. So uh, AI um, learns based on your data, not on somebody else's data. So yes, we do take uh, all kinds of measures to make sure that it will be safe and secure uh, and we're not gonna overstep anything that shouldn't be overstepped and we work with um with hr and with admins and with uh their it uh you know experts uh and cybersecurity experts to make sure that we will uh protect them from all sides so it's a very important question and this is probably um this is like the bottleneck when it comes to implementing a lot of um projects but uh at the same time the uh the best part about it is it's your data as a company you decide what you want to do with it uh and uh you know uh these are your insights uh and uh yeah now we can uh move to the video all right so now let's uh let's look how do we collect these data points from the employee perspective amy will you be able to show it yeah so from the employee perspective it looks like this so basically you have an app uh, and it's also available on a web of course. Um, and you can just, uh, you can just, again, it's kind of hard to see here, but you can ask the system, hey, I need to book a desk. Um, uh, and uh, the system will remind you like, hey, do you need a parking? Uh, or uh, it can be, uh, hey, I need to work with my work based Anna. Uh, let me book a desk next to her. Or uh, I need to meet with uh, these people uh, uh, in Toronto office um, and uh, the system will remind you not just book you the space that really meets your needs, but also will order lunch uh, if it's, you know, if the meeting is happening during lunch hours. So uh, from the admin perspective, you can ask all kinds of questions about your space. What are the right size opportunities? How can I increase employee engagement? What do they need uh, from me to deliver uh, better employee experience? And at the end, you get uh, up to 80% um, uh, uh, office space optimization, and uh, you can increase productivity by 30%. So again, there are so many different use cases. And what we really like to do, we like to start with the most painful problem, whatever it is, and then we uh, work on some other uh, less important uh, aspects of uh, uh, employee experience and uh, employee engagement. So we cover the most important ones. Usually they're around... Uh, you know, space, how to book a desk, how to book a room, uh, how to invite your guests, how to process all of your guests without office managers having to do all of this hard work. And they have already a lot of, uh, uh, a lot on their shoulders. So we cover the basics first. And then from there, we kind of, we can take it to the next level and we can elevate the experience to whatever level and whatever degree you uh, would like it to be elevated. to. All right, do we have any more questions here? Amazing. No, and I think we are at the top of the hour and I want to be respectful of everybody's time. But before we jump off, I think maybe we can just do a quick 
one last thought before we leave. If you each have one additional point that you want to make or leave our audience with in terms of what to keep in mind when implementing or transforming processes with AI in order to elevate employee experience and building performance. I know we leaned more heavily into employee experience and maybe alluded to building performance. So we may save that enough for another webinar as well, but let's do a quick round Robin um, just to hear one last thought that you want folks not to lose sight of. Um, maybe we can start with Dan, are you ready to start? Sure. Yeah, I'll go quick. Uh, yeah, there's so many things related to building performance, and uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about uh, one tool that we used recently, Autodesk Forma, on our office, which we just remodeled, and we have a, a hot desk system, and we have less desks than people from day one, and uh, have the opportunity to actually grow as a company without having to expand space or add desks or reconfigure, which is really exciting. Um, and some of that is based on some, you know, fundamental principles of uh, like Flato is a B Corp and we're going after certifications like um, well building and focused on occupant health and comfort in addition to having uh, a beautifully beautiful looking building. Um, and so, yeah, the, the sustainability and occupant health of the workplace experience is really important. I look forward to more features like what we saw um, here. Uh, and and like dashboards and opportunities to track things like embodied carbon and material reuse and support of the circular economy. So I could go on and on, but that's that's my final thoughts. Perfect. Uh, Alita, you're still off mute. So I was wondering if you wanted to jump back in and say your last thought. Yes. Uh, so um... I believe that there are so many opportunities uh, right now, uh, and we even don't know the full extent of uh, where, um, you know, uh, this new wave of AI will uh, take us. Um, I think it's most important right now to cover the basics, uh, you know, cover the most use cases to really uh, try it for yourself, uh, try to get, try to cover most painful problems that your organization or your customer's organization is facing right now, whether it's like too many desks, not enough people, uh, uh, too many people, not enough desks or vice versa, or simply, um, uh, you know, less than perfect uh, employee experience and kind of like take it from there. But I do think it's quite important to start maybe playing with it right now uh, to see what else can the system do for you. Uh, and that's where I believe a lot of new opportunities that even us, we don't know yet uh, what's going to happen in, in a year or two. That's where a lot of opportunities are uh, still there. Um, but whatever we have already, it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. So uh, I'm very excited for uh, the future. Um, I've been working in this industry for the past 18 years, uh, and it never stops to amaze me what, uh, you know, what new things uh uh, what kind of new products uh, come up? And uh, again, I do believe Sky's link. So excited to uh, to share some more use cases if anyone is curious. Perfect. Federico? I'll keep it brief because I know people have to jump. Uh, but I wanted to uh, just say thank you to Amy to for inviting us and, and, and having us. And um, uh, yeah, that, that's my closing thought. Don't, don't, uh, every... Uh, all of this stuff is changing super quickly. And I think we all need to just sort of take it in stride. Um, but there's a there's a lot of positive with it, uh, as much as there, as much as there isn't. So love that. Short and sweet. We hit all the points that you wanted to hit. So why not just leave it there? And so with that, um, thank you everybody for joining us and listening to us share what we've learned, what we've seen, what's on our minds in terms of how AI is integrating itself into our world of workplace employee experience and building performance. I hope you've started to see that there is such a diversity of ways that it can be applied to optimize, adapt, improve your, not only your designs, but the way in which you interact with, with your workplace environment. So thank you for joining us. I hope you learned something and we're excited to see you at our next webinar. Bye. Thank you so much.